Hank Rutherford Hill, son of World War II veteran Cotton Lindall Hill, father to Robert Jeffrey Hill. But perhaps most important of all, he is the assistant manager of Strickland Propane. Hank is a proud citizen of the Lone Star State, a traditional man with traditional values, and he does his best to instill these values into his son Robert, better known as Bobby. This disconnect between father and son fuels a fire within the Hill home, one that is so destructive that it's constantly eating away at the foundation of both their house and the bond that they share as a family. But as a man of pride and a devout propane user that would never be caught dead using an alternative fuel source, if you were to ask Hank what's wrong, all he'd tell you is, That boy ain't right. Hank Hill was born on April 19, 1953, in the ladies' restroom at Yankee Stadium. This inconvenient birthplace was a direct result of his father Cotton, taking his very pregnant wife Tilly to the stadium as a means of getting closer to his assassination target, Fidel Castro. Now Cotton wasn't ordered by anyone to kill Fidel, he just wanted to do it. Because America. The attempt, however, didn't go as planned, as Tilly went into labor right as Cotton's friend Topsy began to blow a poison dart in Castro's direction. The sudden surprise of her wailing caused Topsy to misfire, hitting a player on the field instead. Hysteria erupted in the stadium, which evidently ruined Cotton's chance at assassinating Castro. The day that Hank was born would perhaps be the worst day of Cotton's entire life, potentially even surpassing the day that he lost his shins as the fury he carried towards the existence of the Prime Minister of Cuba was all for naught. So as a result, he refocused his fury onto the very thing that ruined his grand plans to make a mark upon history. And unfortunately for Hank, that thing was him. Having a fiery pride in his military background, Cotton more than likely had unattainably high expectations for his son. So in order to make sure that his boy grew up right, he subjected Hank to an entire childhood of military-grade verbal abuse. And this abuse would continue on well into Hank's adulthood, all the way up until the day that Cotton finally passed away. Racist. Well, what do we have here? A cooking tojo! Misogynistic. You will never know if you are attractive. It's up to a man to tell you that. Self-entitled. Diddy woman, my toes are cold. Knit me a blanket. Those words only scratch the surface of who Cotton Hill really is. But while all of his actions have definitely made their impression on everyone he comes into contact with, the biggest impression has been left on Hank. Cotton's abuse has had a lot of negative effects on Hank's development, most of which Hank would likely never admit to. The most obvious being his inability to properly handle his emotions. We see in multiple instances throughout the series that Hank has a tendency to overreact to things. In a way, it's a part of his charm as a character, and he's a well-written character too. But a good way to think about Hank and the way in which he reacts is to imagine a coin being flipped inside of his head. On one side of the coin, there's just one word. Bah! And on the other, a phrase. I'm gonna kick your ass. Hank spouts these lines constantly as they are two of his many catchphrases. But it's worth mentioning these two phrases specifically because they are alike in the sense that they are almost always in overreaction to whatever is happening. Now don't get me wrong, there are definitely moments when these kinds of reactions can be completely justified, especially when you take into account the kinds of personalities Hank has to deal with on a daily basis. But let's be real for a second. If you caught your neighbor mowing your lawn out of spite, would you scream in horror? If a magician was refusing to tell you the secret behind a trick, would you threaten to kick their ass? No, at least, I hope not. Temperament aside, there are other ways in which Cotton has influenced his son. Before he heeded the call of sweet lady propane, Hank was drawn to and even excelled in the traditionally masculine outlets that are prominent in American culture. Whether it be woodworking, auto maintenance, and sports, the biggest being football, these were fields in which he did quite well in. He even went on to become a record-breaking running back for his high school football team. Once he graduated, he applied to enlist in the army with Bill. However, his military career never came to fruition on account of his... 
narrow urethra, as the officials believed he wouldn't be able to relieve himself <laughs> in times of stress. <laughs> oh, this poor fucking guy. Oh. I have a narrow urethra. Yes, I do. Anyways, my theory here is that Hank gravitated to these traditionally masculine outlets and pursuits as a way to prove to not just his father, but to himself, that he is without a doubt a true man. It's not that difficult to come to the conclusion that Hank grew up with a chip on his shoulder, along with feeling the need that he has something to prove. And if you want to get really sad for a sec, one could even make the argument that all of Cotton's harassment about Hank being a girl and not being good enough did the job in terms of Hank having success in these specific fields. Psychological consequences be damned. However, when Hank was denied by the army, it served as a harsh message that perhaps his father was right about him. Despite everything that Hank had worked for over his adolescence, he wouldn't be able to prove to his father once and for all that who he is was enough. But apparently, it wasn't. And worst of all, it was both something completely out of his control, as well as incredibly emasculating. All that this newly traumatic information could do was affirm all of the baseless insults that his father subjected him to his entire life. Hank was now aware that he had already experienced his glory days in high school and didn't have much left to look forward to. Until one day, when Buck Strickland recruited Hank to quit his job at Jeans West and join the Strickland Propane family. Buck saw potential in Hank, and Hank realized this, making Buck into what was essentially a surrogate father figure, which gets explored in the episode The Father, The Son, and JC, when Hank, in the heat of the moment, says to Buck, I love you! Which he has never said to Cotton. Yikes. And it was not too long after joining the Strickland family that Hank started a family of his own. Even when the doctors told him that the low sperm count caused by his narrow urethra would make having a child be rather difficult. But he overcame those odds, making him feel on top of the world. However, our past experiences, whether they be good or bad, will always make up a large percentage of who we are as human beings. So even if Hank's life had improved in a multitude of ways, there is, for lack of a better term, still a seed of cotton that rests within Hank's subconscious, and it shows most in the worst possible place. His parenting. Why are you always trying to turn me into you? Why can't you accept me for who I am? Who I am? Now to Hank's credit, he's a much better parent than Cotton ever was. But despite that, there are still plenty of moments where Hank could be doing a lot better. And I'm not just talking about him saying the phrase, that boy ain't right, with Bobby in earshot constantly, although that is part of the issue. On one hand, Hank is very present in Bobby's life and genuinely wants to see his son succeed. But problems quickly arise as Hank is very stuck in his ways and almost too hands-on when it comes to raising his son. We see how Hank can't help but impose his belief system onto almost everything Bobby does, trying to mold him into what he believes his son must become. And when we start to spend more and more time with these characters, it's made abundantly clear to us that Bobby isn't like Hank and will probably grow up to be vastly different from him. And to that I say good. Now before you get mad at me for demonizing America's favorite propane salesman, Allow me to agree that Bobby is definitely a weird kid, and many of the decisions that he makes are indeed questionable. <coughs> Bobby! Mom! <coughs> We've witnessed Hank save his ass many times, usually when Bobby has gone too far into the deep end of a foreign situation. But also keep in mind that Bobby's at the age where everyone is at their most awkward and most uncomfortable. If you can honestly say, that you weren't at least a little awkward or lost as you started to hit puberty, you are a liar and need to start being a bit more honest with yourself. Hell, I'll even admit to my own awkwardness at that age. It sucked. So. The start of your teen years are extremely frustrating and confusing as you suddenly feel rushed to figure out who exactly you are, when in reality, there is no rush. We must be getting old, Connie. 
We're 12, Bobby. We are old. But with all of that being said, I'm honestly kind of impressed with how Bobby is able to be as confident as he is. It's as though he's aware of the fact that he's at a very pivotal age and he wants to do as much as he can in order to figure out where he truly belongs. And with that bravery comes a lot of risks as well. And Bobby ends up realizing his mistakes either right before or right as Hank swoops in to save him. Hank believes that by being so present in Bobby's life, he's preventing Bobby from going through the same hardships and trauma that he did. But in reality, He's just coddling his son and affirming to Bobby that he is always right. It goes to show a father knows what's best for his kid. And the mother, although well-meaning, is usually wrong. And when he's not coddling his son, Hank is forcing Bobby into the exact same activities that interested him at Bobby's age. Why? Because that's just what boys are supposed to do. According to Hank, anyways. But that's what he did. He's trying to copy and paste the same positive experiences that he had onto his son, but he's too focused on what he wants versus what Bobby actually needs. If anything, Hank is merely projecting his own insecurities about himself onto his son, steering him in a direction that Bobby clearly doesn't want to go in. I mean, the man has gone on record saying that he even expects Bobby to go into propane. But does Bobby really want that? No. He doesn't, and he knows that that's not what he wants. And naturally, Hank's expectations and influence take a great toll on Bobby's mental well-being, because nothing he seems to do ever gets his dad's approval. But just like Hank wants to be proud of Bobby, Bobby wants nothing more than for Hank to be proud of him. Why do you have to hate what you don't understand? I don't hate you, Bobby. I meant soccer. Oh. Oh yeah, I hate soccer, yes. Now it's time for Cotton to come back into the picture because believe it or not, his relationship with Bobby is perhaps where he shines the brightest in terms of, you know, showing genuine love for someone. Now don't get me wrong, he doesn't make any efforts to censor himself around his grandson and continues to be a bad influence, but you get a sense that he's actually trying. He has this pride in Bobby that he never really seemed to have with Hank. In the episode next of Shin, where it's revealed that Cotton has gotten his wife Dee Dee pregnant, him and Hank for once have a heart-to-heart -heart about parenting. Hell, if it's a contest on who's the better daddy, you win. You made Bobby. All I made was you. Much like Hank, Cotton genuinely wants to see Bobby succeed and grow up to be a man, but with the luxury of being his grandfather and having less responsibility, he's more comfortable with being kinder to Bobby than how he was with his own son. Naturally, Cotton still has his moments where he goes completely overboard, like when he gave Bobby a loaded rifle for his 12th birthday, or when he wants to get Bobby a prostitute. Same episode. But he has a genuine love and appreciation for his grandson, and it's nice to see that Cotton isn't as cold-hearted as he likes people to think he is. And in a way, Bobby acts as the force that's able to bring Cotton and Hank together. And so does Jimmy Carter, but that's not relevant to this. To close my thoughts in regards to the Hillmen, there is one episode in particular that, in my opinion, perfectly encapsulates the relationship between these three characters, as well as proves that Bobby may not be as, a uh, not right as Hank claims him to be. Season 7, Episode 15, entitled An Officer and a Gentle Boy. It's in this episode that Hank grows increasingly irritated by Bobby's lack of interest in responsibility and how he somehow manages to always find a way to goof around. So at Cotton's suggestion, Hank enrolls Bobby in a two-week-long boot camp at Fort Burke, which is the same military academy that Cotton went to as a young cadet. And before even arriving, Bobby has been pumped full of horror stories about ways in which he's going to be broken down and rebuilt by the time he leaves. But not too long after arriving, Bobby quickly finds out that Fort Burke has changed their way significantly. Physical hazing is no longer a thing. They're given healthy meals, and their classes are centered around learning practical military skills. However, once Cotton catches wind about how the academy has now gone soft, he uses his status as both an alumni and a veteran in order to take complete control over the school. Now this is all important information to bring up, because prior to Cotton taking control over the situation, it's one of the few times that we see Hank and his father on the same side. That, yeah, Bobby could probably gain something from doing this. 
but as soon as Cotton learns about the changes, he decides that he's going to take Bobby's discipline into his own hands, possibly even subject him to treatment that is worse than what Hank got as a kid. But what we witness is actually kind of amazing. As Bobby takes on a gauntlet of supposedly torturous trials with ease, so in order to wipe the smile off of his face, Cotton throws Bobby into what is known as the hole. The hole is apparently what broke Cotton in his academy days, so he figures that it'll do the trick in setting Bobby straight. And this time around, Hank isn't there to bail him out like he always does. In fact, it takes him three days to even figure out what Cotton has done. Once Hank finally arrives and Bobby is released, we figure out that Bobby is completely fine, to everyone's shock. In fact, he's exactly the same goofball that he was three days prior. As they all walk away, one of the cadets asks Bobby how he made it three entire days in the hole, to which Bobby says that he was encouraged by a little motivational graffiti. That graffiti was left by Cotton during his time in the hole. However, as opposed to Bobby's three days, Cotton only made it two. So if Bobby was able to make it a full day more than Cotton, it kind of makes you think that Maybe the boy who ain't right is actually alright. Because this whole time, it was never about Bobby. It was about Hank. Because he is the real boy who ain't right. So this is when I normally scream sing a song very badly, however for this video I didn't really want to do that and I didn't know what I wanted to do. So instead I am going to recite my favorite Hank Hill line in my world famous totally not terrible Hank Hill impression. Here we go. <clears throat> do I look like I know what a JPEG is? I just want a picture of a god dang hot dog. Nice.